Hi everyone, you're watching the Virtual Amicus, and I'm Jay Lodha. Well, India is one of the world's largest manufacturers of textile and apparel, providing employment to around millions and millions of people. We are also one of the largest consumer markets in the world when it comes to apparels and textiles. So, fashion law obviously is an is a very inherent aspect of our Indian culture. But what is the first thing that comes to your mind when I mention when I take the word or uh, 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 pronounce a fashion law? is it is it a law that governs fashion or is it just legal protection that it gives to thousands and thousands of fashion designers now how does one seek shelter where does one go because there is no codified law as far as the fashion law is concerned there is no particular statute that governs fashion law in india where does one go in case of there is some kind of an infringement of a particular design of a designer where does one go what are the forums available and so today we decided to seek assistance from someone who needs absolutely no introduction in the field of fashion law well not just that she will also be covering one more topic which is the nus masters llm program so today the amicus for today's session will be covering two topics one on fashion law the basics uh, as well as the practice areas and number two how to crack the masters program that the nus uh, university has to offer and just to give you all a brief introduction about Our amicus for today's session. Today we are joined by Miss Namrata Pawa, who is an alumni of University of Calcutta, who went on to pursue her masters from National University of Singapore. She has carved a niche for herself in entertainment law, information technology, privacy laws, and she specializes in intellectual property laws. Uh, she also represents various corporations, institutions, and individuals. Her chamber handles IP prosecution, litigation, and transactional work on a regular basis in various fora, pan India. she's also argued many famous cases like india's first standard essential patent litigation before honorable delhi high court she's also recently introduced a new vertical which is fashion law which is extremely upcoming and interesting and she's also regularly in invited to speak at webinars forums conferences given her vast knowledge on intellectual property and media laws so today she's here to give us better clarity on fashion laws so um thank you so much uh, ma'am for taking out time for doing this session uh, anything that you wish to say before we start with our q and a segment uh thank you so much uh, jay for having me it's, it's a wonderful platform for everybody to uh, get their doubts sorted uh it's my pleasure entirely to be here and whatever uh, my experience has been whatever my two cents i can provide to uh, other people and be there for them where um at least i know that i had nobody to uh, answer these questions so it will be it will be my pleasure to do that yeah likewise even i didn't have anybody <laughs> so <laughs> thank god for this platform now let's quickly start with our uh, q and a segment uh if in a nutshell you could explain what fashion law is broadly and what laws uh, govern fashion law in india over to you right so um i get this question a lot because fashion law is both uh so intriguing intriguing so new so novel so interesting to many that um uh, but many don't understand what it really is so the way i like to explain it is that uh think of fashion law as an umbrella and uh, because as we know there is no one codified statute or one codified law which um defines all of uh, what fashion law is so within that umbrella you will find many many laws um which fall in the ambit uh can starting from um from company formation you go to torts uh, of course intellectual property is one of the most important facets of fashion law uh we go to employment law labor laws um there's counterfeiting issues uh criminal liability which fall into fashion law so um if you could imagine all the laws that you would require to sort out the problems from uh the thought of say a creation an artistic creation to it it being um you know it being uh going to the carriers to uh the warehouses to uh the supply chain issues and of course uh, to the end consumers and then back again if there are any issues so all the laws that you would require uh, including customs laws also that uh, fall under the ambit which is called fashion law so in a nutshell it encompasses uh, a lot of other laws 
so you can see the protection and the different different of laws for different infringements and uh, very well now going ahead with our next question uh, what exactly is the nature of your work the position you're at, you're at as a fashion and entertainment law attorney and what kind of matters or cases do you take up okay so um my chamber uh, we primarily do um fashion and entertainment uh, matters like you said so i'll quickly just jot down whatever the kind of matters that i do so uh, first and foremost we do intellectual property now in intellectual property we do prosecution which means filing of all ip uh, and all ip me i mean trademark copyright design patent um we do uh, transactional work transactional again means uh, contract drafting vetting uh, and then of course uh, dispute resolution so dispute resolution can go on to litigation or adr uh, now apart from ip we also do a lot of arbitration matters uh, solved through adr of course uh, but apart from uh, ip issues we do entertainment matters which can be solved through adr or um which are born out of uh, a, a contractual uh, dispute um apart from that uh, entertainment matters as uh, as uh, interesting is, as it may sound it's there's a lot of negotiation that needs that goes through when you're negotiating a contract um we do a lot of employment matters because it falls under the ambit again um one very interesting thing that we do is ip management so for say uh, design houses or big companies we manage their ip portfolio so what does that mean so i managing an ip portfolio which means that of course if they have say um 500 trademarks filed or 300 designs filed so of course you will keep a track of them uh if they're not already registered um and you will see if there are if there aren't any other infringing parties in the market so you have to keep a track of um other ip which is filed which is which can be deceptively similar to your client's marks so these are the few ways that uh, we do ip management or ip management uh, portfolio and then of course if if something leads to litigation then at least litigation so these are the few things that that uh, comes out of my on top of my head yeah fantastic now going ahead with our next question uh any landmark deal or any such transaction or any such case that you've been a part of in this area and you want to discuss with all the viewers who are watching this um there are many actually uh landmark deals i would say if there are deals then i would have to say uh, we do a lot of artist uh contracts okay so say uh we our chamber gets uh, artist contracts on on an almost everyday basis so uh, either we're negotiating with uh, big production houses like say balaji telefilms sony telefilms z telefilms anurag basu dharma productions so uh, that i i won't be able to pick one or two because uh, every deal is interesting every negotiation call is interesting uh but uh the entire procedure of it, the entire uh, way that we have to you know the tactics used in those calls because um as you know mine is an independent practice and uh, say if you're dealing with somebody like dharma productions where they have maybe like a 2025 legal team so having to negotiate what my artist client wants in uh, in front of uh, a 25 uh, legal team it's uh, it sometimes gets daunting but uh, at the end of it it's very thrilling to be very honest because um you know uh, you have to put your best foot forward for your client which is the artist uh, and sometimes it's it's the opposite where i am on the production side and the artist uh, lawyer is uh, negotiating with me so this happens on an everyday but um my most special litigation case would have to be uh, india's first scp litigation uh, which was before the delhi high court i think it was in 2016 no sorry 2017 um the judgment was reserved for i think a year or a year and a half uh, but that was the first time that i was um 
thrown into the deep end i would i would say because the the litigation was given to my senior and i at, at the um, final hearing stage so having to first sort out uh, documents uh, which went on for about seven or eight years and then of course uh, understanding the matter understanding what patent litigation is um, and all of the things that went through with it so that was uh, the most exciting part uh, of my litigation career uh, but apart from that uh, trademark copyright design infringement cases are are like the everyday matters that we do very yeah. well now now that you're the go to person in this field you've established yourself as a successful practitioner now uh, this is my personal favorite question uh, how and when did you identify your passion in this field because obviously it is passion that drove you and you know you you were here because of that so how did you end up here was it was it by accident or was it by design planning so i have not to say a bit of both because uh, it just so happened that from my first uh, job which was uh, in delhi actually no i have to i have to say my first job my first first job was in calcutta uh, for a very short time um it was in ip so uh, i've worked in various fields like i've i've you know when when you really start your own practice people say that don't restrict yourself just to one field take take up whatever matters that come your way so i, I tried doing other matters but my interest uh, had de- developed so strongly over the years through all of my previous work experiences all of my previous internships um that uh, i slowly gravitated towards ip and entertainment matters it so happened uh, almost uh, by grace of god and of course um, Uh, solely by features uh, beyond my understanding that i i i would get matters uh, like that as well and i would say that uh, during the pandemic was uh, when in my opinion i uh, i pivoted because i uh, took it upon myself because of course it was the pandemic it was the lockdown and nobody you were sitting at home so i just happened to write a lot so i dedicated my time to researching writing and i was always fond of the fashion world i was always interested in uh, the entertainment and media matters uh, on like a general layman basis as well so i should just uh, research on that and write my two cents on it and uh, i would get webinar um, invites starting from it started with uh, you know student body organizations went on to really big universities and of course then now we now we do international uh, webinars as well um but yeah it it the i pivoted during the lockdown because that's when i formulated the fashion law course because um i was also you know quite uh, you know, taken aback by the fact that we don't have anything like that in india and uh surprising so we do have it in uh, uk and the us especially in the us where there are universities teaching fashion law as a module as a full fledged course so i wish that uh, i want to see that in india as well because uh, it, the country definitely needs that and and i'm sure i think given the uh, the enthusiasm the interest that i see in in today's uh, students i think i think we we might get there soon Mm-hmm. so uh to be able to build a successful career in the field of fashion law do you think it is very important for for someone who aspires to be a successful practitioner to be passionate about fashion and to follow fashion in and out you know to subscribe to those magazines and do you think that is part of it or uh, how is it in your case uh? so i'll tell you one thing i don't know how other people do it but in my opinion and the way i live my life is that if i don't like something if i don't like reading something if i don't like listening to or about something i will not be able to do that for days on end okay like suppose if if i'm forced to do say a really really boring matter which i have no interest in i can of course we as as lawyers we are trained to do our best to train to research and adjudicate at the best of our abilities but in my opinion uh if you want a long 
successful, mentally satisfying career only if you are passionate, only if you really like the subject, really like the matters, then please get into it. Because if you don't, then, you know, after a while, maybe five or 10 years and the, you know, when the enthusiasm fizzles out, then you're just, you're just dragging along. So that's how I live my life. Um, I've, uh, yes, I've been a part of the entire magazine culture and, uh, you know, keeping a track of uh, the glitz and the glamour, but that doesn't really, that's not a prerequisite. So uh, you don't need to follow um, what used to happen. You don't need to follow what the celebrities are doing. Uh, law is, uh, thankfully, IP is very uh, explicitly mentioned in our act. So what you need to do is uh, tend to what your client's needs are. So yes, uh, to have the passion to read upon it, to get to know what uh, the industry is doing abroad, uh, to see kind of the kind of precedence that they're uh, that they're deciding abroad. Because uh, thankfully in, in in India we can actually uh, put international precedence in terms of IP um, during litigation. So you have to follow those things. But uh, your you know your quintessential uh, TV culture and magazine culture, and that's just just for uh, just if you like it, but that's not a prerequisite. But yeah, just if you truly love your, if you truly love your subject, if you truly love your matters, then all this thing, these things will just come naturally to you. That's what I think. Very well. So to all the viewers who are watching, it's not a prerequisite to follow what is happening on page three, what is happening in the fashion world. And instead, it is very important to study intellectual property as a subject. What is taught to you in law school? probably that will, you know, be a stepping stone or probably the first step, you know, to establish yourself in the field of fashion law. Now, uh, going ahead with our next question, ma'am, uh, what would be your piece of advice to all the young lawyers watching this, to all the law students uh, who wish to build a successful career like you have in this field? So if you could recommend any, any particular literature, any internships, because this is something obviously not taught in law school in the, in the form of fashion law. This is this might yeah. you know this may be taught with on di in different statutes like intellectual property etc. Yeah. So um, the, see, there are so many things that I, that, I, that a student can do right now. Uh, when you and I were studying, when you and I were in law school, uh, internships were uh, you know people used to be so aggressively following for internships and just do do any internship which comes your way. But right now I see students that are, they're very categorical, they're very thought oriented that, you know, they want to pursue something so they only do that, those kind of internships, which, which I applaud as well. Uh, but yes, um, since there, is, there isn't any one particular kind of literature that one can just pick up, um, having said that, there is a lot of literature. Uh, you know, just, just go on Google, um, Tight fashion law in India abroad. There is so much to read. You, we have webinars like the ones that you're doing right now. Watch them. Watch other people. What do what they have to say? What their experience has been like? Um, and you know, you never know uh, where you might find the information from. So uh, I do get a lot of students come to me and say that you know I want to be a fashion lawyer and I am very interested in the topic because. <clears throat> they only see uh, the glitz and glamour of it. They only see that, oh, it's so interesting and uh, it's, it's very uh, intriguing. But um, when I ask them, what do you like about the subject? They, they're like, I just like it. So it does, that doesn't really answer your question. Uh, please do as many internships as you can because there is no better way to understand the topic than being, than being working and then practically so do internships, doesn't have to be from a very big law firm, uh, doesn't have to be from, for many, many months, just do anything that comes your way, but uh, choose the right um, employer or choose the right senior that you want to intern under. That's what I usually tell my interns because that's what I think I would have benefited from when I was a law student that, you know, uh, even though you're working with, say, X uh, law firm, which is the India's best law firm, but you're doing extremely menial, extremely 
um, you know, ridiculous kind of work, which doesn't really, it's not really going to benefit you in any way. So uh, instead of that, do some research on the kind of senior, the kind of uh, matters that you would want to maybe work on as well, and then choose uh, the internship. So more than just Googling top five law firms, top five IT law firms, top five fashion law law firms in the country, do a little more on that. Uh, there's LinkedIn that you can use. There are so many platforms now that it's uh, you, a law student just has to put in some effort and there is a world of information waiting. I think their uh, research plays a pivotal role. I think very important to research. Do you, to all the viewers are watching, do your research, exhaustive research, and then probably shortlist those boutique law firms that specialize in this field. Try picking up courses, you know, enroll yourself for courses, read about the field, read about the subject, and then take a call whether you want to build a career or not. So, um, yeah. and ma'am, uh, who was your mentor in this journey? If you ever had one in fashion law and IP at all, intellectual property, yeah. Um, so honestly, I have to say that I don't believe in mentorship. Uh, I don't believe in having one mentor. Let's put it that way. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to have great employers. I was lucky enough to have um, great leaders who taught their juniors and instead of just dictating work, right? So. Um, that's what I also like doing with my juniors and my interns. Uh, but <clears throat> I, <clears throat> excuse me, I uh, like to learn from everybody, to be very honest. I like to learn from my seniors, uh, the judges, international attorneys. I like to learn from my interns because they're the new generation. They're, they're more updated, I feel. I like to I, I like to learn from uh, you know the court staff because they know what's happening in and out. So I grab the opportunity to know more, to grasp more knowledge. Um, I like to listen to other people doing webinars because uh, you know what happens in in private practice is that uh, you're so focused on your work, you're so uh, you know. You're completely, you have those horse blinders on, but uh, only when you hear other people talk, only when you hear other people's opinions uh, will your knowledge grow. So um, if, if, even if you don't have one mentor or if you do have a mentor, uh, keep your eyes and ears open. Just take in whatever you can, whenever you can, um, because at the end, you're going to do the work. At the end, it all falls on your shoulders and you should have that much knowledge to take your client uh, from problem to resolution. So that's what I feel. Fantastic. So that brings us to the end of segment one on fashion law. Well, thank you so much, ma'am, for sharing all your valuable insights. I'm sure it will benefit all our viewers of watching. Feel free to write to us as far as fashion law is concerned and how to, to build a successful career. Anything that you want to ask with respect to vis-a-vis -vis fundamentals or concepts or fashion as a field, feel free to write to us because our email is mentioned on the channel. Now, uh, if you're ready, we can start with our segment two, which is on National University of Singapore. Yeah, absolutely. Very well. Now, at the beginning of our session, we did mention that Mama has pursued her master's LLM from the very prestigious National University of Singapore, and she did that in international business law. Now, um, there are certain questions that we've prepared in a form of a Q&A segment. So if you're ready, we can start with the Q&A segment. Yes, sure. So question number one, um, at what stage of your LLB undergrad course uh, did you decide to study further, pursue the master's program? So uh, I'm going to answer this question very honestly, because that's, I think, the best approach. So I did my bachelor's from University of Calcutta. Um, as we all know, it's a government law college, and in twenty, in the early two thousand tens, it was. Um, I didn't really have a college experience, so as as great as CU is uh, now, and it's been developing, it's been growing its infrastructure, and it's been growing its um, base in itself. But uh, when I was a student. Um, 
I was very disappointed with how uh, the LLP experience was. Um, of course, we did our classes, we did our, uh, we did our course, we did our, you know, we did our tuitions as well. So everything went on fine. Um, the best part of my CU or my undergrad experience was that uh, since there was no particular attendance, um, the, the necessary attendance uh, numbers that you have to make, we were free to do internships all year round. So I made the most of that. Um, having said that, by the end of my fourth year, I think I, I realized that you know, um, number one, uh, my undergrad degree alone is not going to fetch me any say, you know, of course, when you're in a law school, you know, you all you want to do is uh, get a job in in the top five you know, uh, law firms of the country, right? So that's what I wanted as well. And uh, I, had, I had understood by then that they, they were not even willing to give me an internship, leave alone a job. So I knew and I understood that uh, to get a job at, at a prestigious law firm or say in any other job, I would have to amp my CV. Now, how would I do that? My, the, the best possible answer that I could find at that point was to do a master's and to do an international master's in that, uh, that it had to as well. So that's when I decided to uh, you know, check out universities abroad, understand the modules and courses that they're offering, um, what are their, you know, post um, course, uh, do they offer any placements, do they offer internships, so all of those things I started uh, researching on. Very well, now going ahead with our next question, uh, as far as the application process is concerned, in a nutshell, if you could tell us what the applicant is required to start with, um, you know, in terms of all the prerequisites that are required, uh, you know, we're talking about a statement of purpose, good grades, internships, a robust CV, et cetera, for the purpose of securing an admission at NUS. Um, I would have to say NUS is probably one of the few universities in the world that uh, look at you as a student as a whole. So they're not particularly interested in, you know, you being academically, uh, perfect. They're not just looking at your co-curricular, not looking at your extracurricular. They're looking at you as a student as a whole. So, of course, you have to have a particular, they have um, uh, it, but the minimum requirement that they need for uh, grades, but that's pretty doable, I feel. Um, once that's uh, done, then uh, you have to, at least in my time, what we had to do was we had to prepare a statement of purpose. Um, and get two letter of recommendations. So uh, an LOR at that point was, of course, uh, one was uh, I had taken it from uh, my dean and the other one for, was uh, from an internship that I had done previously. Um, the SOP was something which, uh, you know, now I hear so many people, you know, going to consultants and uh, you, you know, asking advice and what to write in an SOP and how to write it. And to be very honest, I had just written it um, from my heart. I have to say that it was um, I had done very minimum research as to uh, what all requirements should or what, should what all should I mention in my SOP? What are the must have, must puts, must, you know, those keywords that you must. I had done nothing like that. I had just. I understood the question. They wanted to know who I am. They wanted to know why I'm applying to NUS, why I'm applying to that particular course, and how will me and them benefit out of though that one, one and a half years. So it was a very simple answer. And thankfully, I am uh, I would be uh, arrogant enough to say that I'm good with my words when in writing. So I was able to, now, of course, I was able to convince them to take me in their course. Uh, but yes, NUS was um, one of the best times of my life uh, because um, it isn't thesis oriented. So, you know, I've, uh, I've, a lot of my other peers, a lot of my other friends went to UK and to US. Uh, apart from it being exorbitant, uh, the fee structure being exorbitant, um, the, the, especially in the UK universities are supposed to write, pick, pick one particular research topic and then write a thesis on it. Um, that 
if if you're very particular if you're very sure of what uh, you want to do for the rest of your life i i think then that's the way to go but in my case i was in sure that you know i want to do business law for for my next 50 years or say it for the next 50 years i just want to do my my masters and uh, so nus gave us the opportunity to pick and choose modules so even though the masters was called international business law business law was a was just one module uh, the our uh, our entire uh, duration was divided into two countries so we had the opportunity to go to shanghai and singapore uh, we did internships in both places we had placement opportunities in both places and of course there were so many modules up up for offer so there was ip there was international carriage of goods um, international arbitration and so many more uh, international level uh, topics that we could choose from and get practical experience from so that was my most favorite part wow well, it must have been an incredible journey um, you know at nus i can totally imagine that uh now uh, do you shortlist any of the law schools uh, other than national university of singapore and why did you narrow it down to nus was it because of the courses that it offers was it because of the prestige value that it carries right so um i had i had also uh, narrowed down um universities in the uk and i had actually applied to them and got into them as well um but what attracted me more towards nus was like you rightly said it was number one it was the best it is the best university in in asia um the modules that it offers none of the other universities offered me um and most importantly i would say the um the the professors and the academicians that used to come and provide lectures either say guest lectures or um just their everyday uh, professors that we had on board were phenomenal they uh, were not only the best in their league um but they were so amazing to they were so approachable so um, practical headed that you know they would say that you know just come over you know let's have a cup of coffee let's discuss this and you know uh, don't worry about it you'll get internships you'll get a job so they would go out of the way to help you um so yeah these all of these things and of course it was a dual country which was uh, any any i think is any law student's dream uh, so all of these um, things uh, combined uh, made me choose nus i think these these conversations that you have with professors the approachability factor really works and yeah. in those 9 10 months that you have at a prestigious university like nus so uh, you know talking about uh, the masters program is you know at nus is concerned what all courses are available if in a nutshell if you can tell or describe to all our viewers and which ones would you recommend and which ones did you ultimately opt for um so in my time we had courses like uh, so since uh, like i had chosen international business law um likewise there was um other stream like other verticals of master as well so there was one purely dedicated to ip so in that particular ip masters they would teach uh, ip from all over the world so and of course give practical experience in that uh then there was one for uh, completely corporate finance where you know we had, they had modules like mergers and acquisitions and uh, corporate re- restructuring and so on so forth um business law with the one that i chose was uh, according to me and my uh, i think 23 year old uh, brain could what could fathom was that i could pick modules you know like i picked one module from ip i picked one module from mna i picked one module from business law so uh, i was a happy child um but yeah if like i like i said previously uh, it worked for me because i wasn't sure of what topic that i want to really pursue right uh, which is why i chose the combination uh, situation but if you are one of the few and one of the very uh, lucky ones that already have a very clear view of uh, your career path then you pick the the masters program that suits you best 
um i think that that will probably be my two cents on it i think that is the best part about such masters programs because they offer that flexibility that you want as an as an undergrad uh, so that you can experiment and ultimately decide later on what subjects you can you know you'll be ultimately specializing in yeah, yeah. so um going ahead with our next question um uh, how rigorous was the course at nus if, if you can talk us through the the examination pattern the lectures that are conducted there and how different are they from the courses that are taught here in india um oh it was very rigorous <laughs> it uh, yes it it's uh, it's just best law school for a reason and um although uh, you know all the fun aside all the amazing things aside uh, when it came to um, hardcore academics um we we were really crushed uh, because we had i think um for we had classes four days a week so one day was three days we were left uh, to do what basically all the work that we had to do um but we had four days a week classes all day long um uh and each class uh, alongside the academics so of course we were we were taught uh, there were books there were research articles that we had to go through uh, every topic and every class and every module has its had its own practical um side of it as well so you know if say if we're doing international arbitration of course you will learn about the tactics you will learn about the statute you learn you learn about the act but you will also be given um, a group activity that you know you with the case study that you know x and y and so on so so four or five students would get together and then you'd have to solve that international arbitration and towards the end of the course there would be a proper litigation a courtroom scenario where you would have to solve the dispute so that happened with each course so uh, to having dealt with all of those things and of course uh, we had examinations we had paper submissions we had practical scenario submissions there, there were so many things on an everyday basis every class was unique um, every module was uh, differently structured and for me especially for someone who had just come out of um, a five year undergrad uh, degree with without really having any classes for me it was uh, not just a culture shock it was uh, it was a, a very thrilling experience and very overburdening but uh, it was i think once you um accept that all this is for your own good all of this studies all of this you know practical examination is for your own good you you find uh, you know enjoyment in it which which i did so i used to love going to the library i used to love because uh, the library also was amazing so i used to love sitting there i used to love reading i used to love uh, researching and then of course collaborating with other students to uh, get through the practical sides of it but um, it was strenuous like i wouldn't i wouldn't say that um, it's is going to be an easy cake walk sort of situation uh, but it's going to be amazing but i would say that uh, from what i've heard from other uh, from my peers that how their masters have been it's been the same uh, some have less practical exposure some have more academic exposure some or vice versa uh, but it's it's strenuous uh, one in the same i think overall uh, uh, the the programs are structured in a way that they are rigorous you know to uh, rigorous and not very easy to crack uh yes not easy to crack and the examinations i i forgot to add the examinations were difficult okay. so you know the we used to have um, a lot of um, you know monthly sort of you know these tests that they they used to keep conducting we used to have monthly yeah. test assessments mm -hmm. yeah and then of course an examination at the end of it and examinations were difficult they weren't uh very easy they want something that you have already discussed in class or something that it was really really uh difficult to cost pass and then get a higher grade uh if you choose to get a higher grade that is so yeah 
I don't know, but I think sometimes I'm of the opinion that is it because the the undergrad courses or the LLB courses that our that our country offers probably they are not as rigorous as they ought to be. That that pro- perhaps could be one of the reasons why you know and this has been a common pattern uh, on all the masters uh, courses that we've covered so far on the virtual Americas. That every course that has been taught, be it Cambridge, be it Oxford, be it Harvard, they all have been very rigorous. And yeah. you know, is it because we are not we are not uh, well prepared or well well equipped to deal with it, or is it that they're actually very rigorous? Because because it is ultimately the master's program, and you are specializing in one particular field. I have to be very honest and say that uh, I don't think the government law colleges in our country uh, are so rigorous. But when it comes to national law universities, because I've seen like my interns and my juniors go through it I've, uh, and I've seen other friends and family who are in national law school they tell me that uh, it's a lot of work that they have their classes and they have the internships and they have their assessments and so on and so forth so I think they are being trained well but uh, unfortunately for government law colleges it's, it's a lot easier it's a lot more relaxed um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, masters, uh, you know, I, okay, to be honest, I keep saying that uh, loss as a subject isn't difficult to understand, okay, it isn't difficult, to, it's not science, it's not uh, technology, or it's not something that is completely bizarre, and you have to read it a thousand times to understand, once you get it, you get it, you will, you will absorb it at some point. But um, which is why we have to go through so many documents. Um, and with, at the end of it, uh, we're trained to read so much and we're trained to absorb so much that uh, it just seems rigorous. But uh, I guess, you know, if, if you are if you, if you're being trained to be a good lawyer uh, academically and, of course, um, through practical means, then you need it. Like I, I wouldn't, I would never recommend any master university or say even even a domestic university to be more flexible. I would say you you must have, uh, you must have you must stretch your students as much as you can because in when they leave the university when when they come to the real world. For number one, it's completely different from your university experience. The laws are completely different. The way the way you interpret it is yours. Um, but the stress of law that you feel when you're starting, you say your own practice or you're working in a big firm, uh, is nothing compared to uh, the rigorousness or the strenuous um, feel of university. So you must have that experience to actually live the legal life that you want to, the career that you want to have. Well, you have to burn the midnight oil. You have to go through that rigorous curriculum that, and that, that the college has to offer. Right. So now going ahead with our next question. Um, so did the master's program there benefit Sorry, just you? Just one here? second. I can't hold yeah, on. Sure. Yeah, so did the master's program there benefit you here? Would you like to share any memorable experiences from campus life? Any lessons that you learned there that you want to share? Um, way too many to uh, share in like a five-minute answer. Um, did it benefit me? Uh, my master's degree benefited me a lot. Um, my first interview out of my master's degree was at Ambarjan. So I'm not saying that that's something that, uh, you know, you should aspire to have, but from somebody, again, I repeat, repeat uh, myself and saying that from somebody who could not get an internship from uh, those five law uh, firms when, when I was doing my undergrad to getting my first job opportunity from the best, apparently the best law firm in the country. So my master's definitely put a sheen on my CV because that's the first thing that employers read, right? The last place that you've studied. Um, apart from that, uh, the exposure, the entire experience of an international LLM 
gave me uh, not just confidence not just academic knowledge but so much uh, it was fulfilling in a sense that i was able to um, get on those interviews i was able to crack some of them and um, in my daily life i feel that i am so privileged to be a part of the alumni which holds so many greats in in the legal fraternity especially in asia and especially in the international circuit um of course uh, i remember I, i go back to a few things that were taught to me in the masters um but uh, like i said again uh, when you're doing it practically it's so different than what we read and study uh, in law school um but yeah my masters experience was uh, was amazing fantastic now um who was your mentor who guided you thoroughly from the application procedure to finishing the masters program if you had any one right so i uh, i didn't um i did everything on myself um there are uh, you know these companies and these uh, you know uh, people that help you with with the kind of documents that you require you know with um, the kind of things that you must write in your sop and so on but uh, it's pretty straightforward to be very honest it's all mentioned very explicitly on all of the websites be it in us be it any other university and and you can just reach out to them if you have any doubt there i've noticed that uh, you know you just email them give them a time of say two or three days and you will get a reply and no no question is completely silly or um, irrelevant if you have any doubt this it's best to clarify because you don't want your application then to get soured uh so yeah i didn't really uh, choose to take help from anybody um both my uk applications and my nus application was done by me um i just uploaded all my documents um and then it went on from there very well and uh, <clears throat> what would be your piece of advice to all the young law graduates lawyers who wish to apply to nus for their llm masters program see before i give a piece of advice that you should apply i would say doing a masters again is not mandatory it's yeah. not something that you must aspire to have on your cv it's not something that will definitely be or you know make or break up career or something like that it's not nothing like that is going to happen um you are going to be a great lawyer even if you don't have a masters degree let's just put it that way okay so uh, please don't put any pressure on yourself that no i have to do my masters i have to do my international masters in fact nowadays uh, masters in india in national law universities and other private universities are so amazing they also provide the same almost the same amount of exposure they provide the same academic knowledge they have international professors coming in so there are a lot of opportunities a lot of ways to do your masters if you choose to do it um now coming to uh, advice to um apply to nus if you are willing to apply to nus uh, please do some thorough research on the university okay so this is something that i had just uh, flipped through and i wish i had done more research but um the university in many ways tells you exactly the kind of student that they're looking for or it, it's all over their website okay so so go through their website see the keywords that they're using do your research um then maybe then uh, you know track back and then write your sop so that would be one tactic that i would probably give um but just be true to yourself you know don't write uh you know be modest be uh, don't just you know over overshine yourself all over your sop um stick to the topic so nowadays i i see a lot of question answer sort of um you know there is not just one uh, one uh, statement of purpose that they're looking for there are a lot of question answers here and there especially in the us universities um 
for them, they, I think they have a word limit to each question as well. So stick to that word limit, stick to the point and just be true to yourself. And uh, if you're meant to go abroad, if uh, you're meant to have that experience and that exposure, you will get it. Otherwise, you'll have an even, be even better exposure and time in wherever you are and whatever you're doing. So, um, yeah, just be honest and just be uh, just be yourself in whatever you're doing. Um, and that's what I feel in your in your profession and in your, in your career as well. Uh, because if you if you try being anybody else, then it's not going to take you uh, take you through everything. Um, yeah, I th I think that would be my advice for for everybody listening. So yeah, good luck on that. <laughs> so broadly, I think uh, to sum it all up, uh, it's very important to be truthful, to be honest to yourself when you're writing down your SOP. To keep the word limit in mind, not to overshine yourself not to write things to flatter somebody else because ultimately uh, if you're meant to be, you were meant to be right. So you have to see whether you stand to be there or not. And um, I think that honest assessment is very important uh, somewhere. So um, now talking about scholarships, do you think uh, does NUS offer any scholarships? Yes. NUS offers scholarships. But apart from NUS scholarships, uh, there are also a lot of private scholarships and grants that uh, a law student can take on. I did not apply for a scholarship, so I cannot give you um, how I went through it and what, if I got it or not. Uh, but yeah, uh, scholarships are available to, you know, from uh, ranging from uh, a small amount to a full scholarship, all of it is available. Uh, and even like I said, a private scholarships. So if, if that's something that you're interested in, please uh, look into that before you apply, before you send out your application, because both have to go hand in hand. You can't send out your application first and then apply, say, a month later. So keep the deadlines in mind so that you don't miss out on uh, these opportunities. I think uh, log on to the website and go through the website properly. I'm sure right. uh, you know they've mentioned everything that they offer as an institution, as a university, uh, scholarships that are available, uh, you know. So I think to all the viewers of watching, it's very important to go through whatever is there on the website. And it is very important to first research and understand whether there are scholarships available. And if yes, then what kind of scholarships are available and um, uh, assess whether you stand a chance or not. That can only happen when you log on to the website. Uh, now talking about accommodation, uh, does NUS guarantee, you know, a hostel accommodation on campus or off campus? Do we, does the student need to find one on his own? So uh, NUS for master's program doesn't provide you on campus accommodation. So NUS law, um, only for law I'm speaking, uh, it only provides on campus accommodation for undergrad. So what we had to do, we were given a list of uh, a lot of private um, Hostels, a lot of private. Sorry, one second. Uh, yeah, so NUS uh, on the website and when you, of course, you've, you've been given a place, then they send you a list of um, private uh, hostels and accommodations uh, within like a five kilometer radius of the campus. Mm. Should you choose to apply there? Um, which I have chosen to. Uh, my hostel was, um, it wasn't solely for NUS applicants. So uh, we had people and students staying from all over and all of the universities in Singapore, which is also a great, great way and great place to meet uh, fellow students. Um, but yeah, there are, there are a lot of other uh, uh, student um, you know, there are a lot of other campuses that uh, are only say, you know, if you live looking for only say uh, gender based um, accommodations, or if you're looking for a co ed accommodation, or if you're looking for an apartment uh, and not a hostel. So there are a lot of uh, already, there are a lot of accommodations available apart from your own campus. So there's nothing to worry about, even if uh, NUS doesn't provide an on campus for master's students, there are many options. So you can just, it's all available online again. And NUS also gives you a full list of it.
and uh, lastly uh, how is the placement situation the placement landscape in singapore at the moment uh, post the pandemic you know if you could if you could throw some light so post pandemic and pre pandemic also i i would judge it both ways uh, so i'll start by what i had gone through uh when i graduated um i had a host of internships lined up for me both in singapore and shanghai um but they weren't hiring uh, full time at that point so what they were offering me was you know say a contractual term or even a paralegal position which i didn't choose to take up should you have that wish to take up a role and you know just have that will to stay on and just uh, you know uh, feel that you know if you can start from a consultant position and then you'll be uh, taken on as a full time associate or whatever then you can you're free to do that um that was the pre pandemic pre uh, when i was when i had graduated uh, now i feel that uh, universities all around the world to be very honest are looking to consume um first their locals okay so if you're a singapore resident if you are um have maybe done an undergrad in singapore maybe done something in singapore first preference is given to you um and then of course if there is a place if there is a vacancy if or if you're so exceptional that uh, you overshine everybody else then you're taken so um that's what i see the situation as of now there um because of course you know uh, it's understandable also because they have just got over lockdown the universities there want to give opportunity to their to their localites to their uh, residents and then of course take on um foreigners who are coming in so uh, having said that that's the, that's the placement situation but that shouldn't um discourage you from thinking that you might get an opportunity because what happens is that uh, you know even though i didn't choose to take the paralegal position or take the contract position a lot of my a lot of my batchmates did it and they're now well very well settled in singapore they have uh, born up the ladder and now they're senior associates and what not in singapore firms they some people are do take have taken up in house positions and they're doing really well so uh, just go with your gut go with what you're feeling at that point get a sense of what the firm is giving you so you will obviously have an understanding of even if it's a paralegal you know in india we some people look down upon such positions or some people feel like you know after my masters how can i do a paralegal position but that's ridiculous because uh you know when i practice in now that i feel um when i say i'm i'm sending out some emails to an international law firm it's mostly always replied by a paralegal they're working so the the um encouragement the respect that is given to any body apart from say associate level is the same as is given to associate and senior sort of associate level so uh, go with the gut go with the feel of what the law firm is willing to provide for you but uh, don't get discouraged with the post pandemic situation if they are giving you an internship if they are give, taking you on in the universities that means there is still scope there is still uh, a place for you in that market a place for you in that country or even in that form so those things should should probably give you um some sort of a leeway or some sort of uh, an understanding of uh, whether you can climb up the ladder or not very well so that brings us to the end of our segment uh, we could cover two topics uh in one session thanks to ma'am who could do that and uh, thank you so much for taking out time for doing this session you know session number 1 was on uh, uh, building a successful career in the field of fashion law where we discussed basics basic fundamentals law various statutes governing fashion law in our country and how to build a successful career in that field and topic the second topic that we discussed today was 
how to crack the master's LLM program offered by the prestigious National University of Singapore. And uh, thank you, ma'am. It really means a lot to me and my entire team. Uh, anything that you wish to say as parting words before we finally wrap this segment? Thank you so much for having me. It was so wonderful to chat with you. I hope uh, I have answered or shed some light uh, on these topics. If anybody has any questions, they can get in touch with me, of course. Uh, I would be more than happy to discuss. But um, yeah, doing a master's degree or creating your niche in a particular legal fraternity or legal arena is something that we some people most mostly want and wish and aspire to have. Uh, and I'm sure all of you who are listening can have that. So just have confidence in yourself um, because confidence will take you places that your knowledge cannot take. Uh, so have that confidence and uh, just go with it. Good luck. So to all the viewers of watching, email is mentioned on the channel. Feel free to write to us in case you have any queries. I'm sure your you know, 99% of the queries must have been answered by now because indeed it was a very elaborate session and uh, uh, valuable insights and uh, such wonderful tips coming in from our expert for today's session. Thank you, ma'am. Once again, we hope to see you on, a, on another session and uh, it's goodbye for now. Bye. Have a nice evening.